we'll be able to, to sort of follow through the, the time period. We're about 500 years uh, further on in the story of things, five to 600 years away from the time period of Abraham and the destruction of Sodom into the time period of Joshua and the conquest of the land, and specifically Hatzor, as we'll look at later on. So just to kind of put up the, uh, the time period again, the Middle Bronze Age, we're at the end of that now, the time of Moses, uh, just at the beginning of the Iron Age, and uh, it's the Late Bronze Age, as they call it, or Early Iron Age. So we're going to begin with Israel's southern campaign, and we're going to follow the two campaigns of Joshua. And as you go through your readings in Joshua, it's helpful, I certainly found it helpful, to kind of get my head around what's actually going on. When Joshua goes into the land, they go into the south first of all, and then they deal with the north afterwards. And so we're going to try and follow the story in somewhat chronological order. So we begin then with Israel's southern campaign. So we're actually going to jump back into Numbers to begin with in chapter 33, because this is Israel as they're encamped just outside the land, ready to go in. So Numbers chapter 33, and we're going to read verse 48 and 49. We read there, they departed from the mountains of Abram, and pitched in the plains of Moab by Jordan, or the Yardin, near Jericho. And they pitched by Jordan, uh, from Beth Jeshemoth uh, even unto Abel Shittim in the plains of Moab. So remember, Abel Shittim is the ancient name of the city of Sodom, the place of the acacia trees. And so this is the area that we're dealing with. And if you just, this is Brother Lane's map, um, where he kind of illustrates exactly where things are at. So the Dead Sea is down here, so north is, is to the left of the map. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea, um, Nebo is up here, and Pisgah, Beth Jeshemosh is here, Abel Shittim is over here. So the area in between, which really sits on the site of uh, Tel al Hamam and that whole plain, in the Kikar of the Jordan, um, is where they would have camped. Beth Abara is here, Gilgal, Jericho. And the plain of Moab runs this way here. So this is the, the period that we're dealing with. And um, it really gives you an idea of the scope of Israel, who's come through the wilderness, 40 years of wandering, and is now sitting in this place, ready to enter the land. So this is the, the valley itself, um, the plain. So they've come from Abel Shittim, and they're coming to Beth Abara. And it says in Joshua chapter 3, if you just want to turn over to Joshua, because we're going to now spend our time in Joshua, chapter 3, and uh, the first verse there, that Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. So they come from their camp, um, right at the foothills, the Nebo foothills, where Moses, of course, has died and has been buried. And Joshua takes over as leader, and they bring them right up to Beth Abora. And um, this is the place, the ford going over Jordan. So we read there in chapter 3 and verse 17, the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of Yahweh stood firm on the ground above in the midst of the Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground, and all the people were passed over Jordan. And in chapter 4 and verse 3, the command was to take the stones out of the Jordan, and they were to carry them over and leave them on the other side as a monument where they were to lodge. And of course, we have that symbol of baptism, the old man entering into the water and being left behind, and they were to take stones out of the Jordan River and bring them and lay them on the other side as a monument a testimony to Israel. So uh, Brother Lane just can explain to us the crossing of the Jordan. Because later on in the, during the trip, when you leave Israel, you cross the river Jordan again. It's just a muddy old stream there. And you go to Beit Abara, or called Bethany beyond Jordan, where Jesus, where John the Baptist baptized. And why was Jesus baptized in Beit Abara? John 1, 28. Because Beit Abara means the place of crossing. That's where Joshua across the land, across the river Jordan, the river of death. How was the water stopped? The ark that was carried on the priest's shoulder first um, dipped the feet in water and the water stopped flowing. Because there was an earthquake 25 kilometers higher up, which cut off the river Jordan, cast a bank right across it, and it happened many times. The last time in 1927, it takes between 12 to 16 hours for the water to start flowing again. Enough time to cross that river of death and enter into the promised land. 
So you can see how he believes that this would have happened. It's happened since those and since that time. An earthquake, obviously caused by the power of God, blocked the river, and it took a period of time for the water to build up until it would flow over once again. It went all, of course, back to the area of Adam. And so here you have that picture of Israel as they come across uh, the Jordan River. So chapter 5 and verse 1, it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites that were on the side of Jordan westward and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that Yahweh had dried up the waters of Jordan be from before the children of Israel until they were passed over. The heart, their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. And so they come across that into hostile territory. The people are terrified, and it's at this point in time an act of faith then has to take place. Because in chapter 5 and verse 2, Yahweh said to Joshua, All right, now you're in hostile enemy territory. Now that you're no longer separated by the river Jordan, I want you to take and incapacitate all your fighting men. You're going to circumcise all the males. And so at that point in time, Israel is absolutely at the mercy of God. My brothers and sisters, that's what we have to realize in our fighting church. Once we cross those waters of baptism, we are helpless without the power of God to save us. And we sometimes think, well, that's the end of the journey. You know, Israel crossed the river Jordan, that's baptism. Sometimes we look at baptism that way. You know, you're in the truth. Well, that's when the race begins. And if you think, well, I'm just not good enough, and I'm not ready, and, you know, I can't do it. Well, God proves to them, you cross the river Jordan, A, you don't do it by your own means. Because it's a miraculous thing anyway, which is what baptism is, the way God has provided. B, once you get across to the other side, you can't do this in your own strength. And just to prove it to them, they're all circumcised on the other side of the River Jordan at a place called Gilgal, which means that they're rolling away. And so here we have them there. They cross over the river. In chapter 5 and verse 10, the children of Israel encamp in Gilgal. And the first thing they do is keep the Passover in the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. So here we have them entering the land some almost 40 years later from when they left Israel or from they left Egypt. In Egypt, they had a Passover and then they crossed over the Red Sea. Here, they cross over the River Jordan and then they have a Passover. But the two things kind of mirror one another. A symbol of God's deliverance, reminding them how God had delivered their parents out of the hands of Pharaoh. And again, it was God that had done them. And of course, when they come into the land, we're told there in verse uh, 11, they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. Unleavened cakes, parched corn, the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. So here we have a situation where, of course, the, the manna that sustained them for 40 years through the wilderness now ceases as soon as they get into the promised land. They begin to eat the fruit of that land. The very fruit, if you remember, that those 12 spies had brought back and showed to them, but the 10 had said, we be not able to overcome. Well, here they are, they're in the land, they're eating that fruit. And so that's the way the story begins to roll out. Turn in your Bible to chapter 5, though, and let's just take a look at this little narrative that happens in verses 13 and 14. It's one of those, I almost call it a, a comical little description. I don't mean funny in that sense, but it's ironic, perhaps. It makes us look at ourselves and sometimes realize where we really stand in relation to the power of Almighty God. Jer uh, Joshua chapter 5 and verse 13, it came to pass when Joshua was in, by Jericho, so they're on their way going up to the city of Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you on our side or are you on the side of our enemies, our adversaries? So this is the angel of Yahweh and Joshua asks him, are you on our side? And the angel says, no. Now you've got to stop and think about that for a minute. Joshua has just been appointed as the leader of God's people by God himself. 
confirmed by the miracle of the crossing of the Jordan. Just the same way that Elisha was confirmed to follow on from Elijah when the Jordan River was, was opened, parted. And they get into the land, and he meets this angel, and he asks the angel, well, are you on our side? And the angel says, no. See, what Joshua had to realize was, it's not a question of, is God on my side? The question that really is being posed is one to Joshua. Oh, are you on God's side? Because notice what he says then. He says, no. But as captain of the host of Yahweh, am I now come? He says, I'm captain of Yahweh's host, Joshua. Not you. And brothers and sisters, that's what we need to realize in the of life. We might think that we're in charge. We might think and hope that, you know, there's God on my side in an issue or whatever else. It's the total wrong perspective. What we have to get through our heads is the question is, am I on God's side? He is the captain of the host, this angel that stands here, Yahweh's host. And Joshua immediately recognizes that and falls down on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And so that's what we've got to ask ourselves in our own lives. Well, we come to the city of Jericho, and of course, we don't have time to go through all the stories of these different places, but just to highlight a couple of uh, things, it's in, in, in Jericho that, of course, we run into Rahab, who had hid the spies before they crossed over. And so we read in, in chapter 11 of Hebrews, in verse 31, it's by faith that Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies in peace. So what she did is recorded as an act of faith. And let's not forget that, brothers and sisters, she believed. She recognized that this powerful, almighty God, Yahweh of the Hebrews, was the only God. And so when those spies came, she received them in faith and did not perish because she believed. And of course, we know the story of how they took the city of Jericho. We were not able to go to Jericho when we were there, uh, simply because of the unrest in the land at the time. From Jericho, of course, they uh, go back to Gilgal, where they're encamped, and uh, they go up from here to Ai. And there's a great defeat that takes place there because of Achan's sin. Remember, they, they've just taken Jericho, and, and everything was to be dedicated to Yahweh. Except Achan saw the silver and the gold and the Babylonian garments, and he took them and he hid them in his tent, and he covered them over, and that was hidden in his tent. And again, it's a great lesson to us, brothers and sisters, as families. What is it we hide in our homes? Are they things that, you know, if they were revealed to the rest of the ecclesia, that we would be ashamed of? And if they are, then get rid of them. Because we don't want to be Achans. We don't want to be people that bring defeat to the children of Israel. And so what happens is, of course, they go up to the city of Ai, and eventually after um, the sin with Achan in chapter 7, and Achan is dealt with, he is stoned, and he's put to death, Ai is taken, and um, from here, of course, uh, we have the story of, the, of them burning Ai and making a great heap forever, so that it would not be rebuilt, um, and whoever rebuilt it, it would be on their own head, which, of course, comes up later on in the text, but we're not going to look at that today. Um, but so, from here, they then go up, um, this is the, the men of war, that is, they go up to Mount Ebal and to Mount Gerizim. The, the, the families are camped back here at Gilgad. This is the fighting men that have gone up to Ai. And they go up to Ebal and Gerizim, and it's there, of course, in chapter 8, that they built an altar to Yahweh, the God of Israel, in Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of Yahweh, commanded the children of Israel, as it's written in the book of the Law of Moses, in Deuteronomy, of course. And there, it's an altar of whole stones, which no man had lifted up any iron, and they offered thereupon burnt offerings unto Yahweh, and sacrificed peace offerings, and wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. And of course, they stand on the two hills, and they sing out the, the blessings and the cursings. So that takes place up in the area of Ebal and Gerizim, which of course is modern day uh, Nabla Shechem of today, right up in that area in the north. And of course, it's here then 
that the Gibeonites come along. Now, they're not that far away from this whole thing. Gibeon is right down here. Uh, Ebal and Gerizim up in the north. Ai is here. Jericho's there. They're camped at Gilgal. So the Gibeonites have watched them take out Jericho. They've watched them take out Ai. And then they're like, well, you know what? We, we don't think our odds are, are very good in this whole situation. So the inhabitants of Gibeon, we read in Joshua chapter 9, just over a page or so, heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and I. They did work wildly, and they went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their donkeys and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and uh, clotted on their feet, old garments upon them, and the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they come, and they convince Joshua that they're from afar. And Joshua makes a league with them. And what he doesn't do is consult God. Brothers and sisters, that's a great lesson for us. As arranging brethren, um, you know, it happens at times that we're, you know, we've got an agenda that's really busy, and there's all these items on there. And I remember going to an ecclesia once and said, well, you know, like, we got so much on the agenda, let's forego the reading at the beginning. And I'm thinking, if we're going to forego the reading, we may as well forget the whole meeting, because without the guidance of God, what's the point? And here's a perfect example of Joshua, who doesn't consult God on this. He just thinks, well, you know, I've been put in charge, and this is what I'm going to do. And really, when we come to complex issues, whether it's like this one, or whether it's, you know, issues in the ecclesia, or even in our families, sometimes we think, well, we know what God says about this. Um, so we don't go bother reading the section that deals with this area or that area. The first thing we should do, no matter how familiar we think we might be, is to open up our Bibles. Let's read what God says about such and such a, an issue that we're dealing with. And, and consult the scriptures first and ask in prayer what God would have us to do and, and look into those things and let him answer us through the word of God. Well, they have to live with it because this Gibeonite deception has taken place and, um, of course, they, they make this league, and they find out that the Gibeonites are actually just from around the corner, and they have to now uh, deal with this, con this, uh, this uh, great um, contract they pretty much went, made with them. Come over to Joshua chapter 10, though, because it's that event that now sparks off all what happens next. And sometimes God uses our mistakes um, sort of as teaching tools, and he works with us. He doesn't just write us off. He works with us and, and helps us through this. So Joshua chapter 10, we find out now, it came to pass that Adonai Zedek, uh, the Lord King of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it. He had done, or Ania had done to Jericho and, uh, and her king, and as so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, and that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than I, all the men thereof were mighty. Therefore, Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem sent unto Hoham, king of Hebron, Hiram, the king of uh, Jarmuth, and um, Japhon, the Japhia, the king of Lachish, and Deber, the king of Eglon. So you can see them there. He sends messages out from Jebus, which is Jerusalem, to, to Hebron, to Lachish, to Jarmuth, and to Eglon to rally the troops. Because we've already lost the Gibeonites. There was a stronger city than Ai, and a royal city, and they were mighty men of war. They've all caved in. So we need now to make an alliance in the south, and that's exactly what he does. And so these guys all sent in Joshua chapter 10 and verse 5, Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, they come and they gather themselves together against Joshua. But Joshua now, uh, the men of Gibeon, who they've made this league with, so they started to gather themselves, not against Joshua, but against Gibeon here. And so the men of Gibeon, with whom Joshua had made the league, uh, sent to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants, come up quickly and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua here is put into the situation, and um, immediately they're called upon, and, and so what he does this time is he, he figures out what he's supposed to do in chapter 10 and verse 6, 
the men of Gibeon have come. So he comes in chapter 9, or chapter 10, verse 9. Joshua therefore came up upon them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. And Yahweh discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon. So he takes out the five kings that have all come up with their armies against the Gibeonites and wipes them out completely. But the story doesn't end there. Because what we find out is that even though that's what he did, it came to pass that whoever's left, it says, they flee. Verse 11, came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the, going down to Beth Horon, that Yahweh cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Ezekiel, and they died. In fact, they that died with the hailstones were, uh, were more than those who the children of Israel slew with the sword. And quite often that's the way it is, is that God is much stronger than we are and fights the battles for us. And he does a much more effective job. And here it is. He, he throws down hailstones from heaven onto them and destroys them as they run from Gibeon through Beth Horon down to this place of Zika. But the story doesn't end there. Because if you just look in your Bibles and you see what's going on here, in Joshua chapter 12, or 10, and verse 12, Then spake Joshua to Yahweh in the day when Yahweh delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and said, In the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon, Ayalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Yasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. Now, think of that, brothers and sisters and young people. If you're ever thinking if prayer is powerful or not, here's the answer. I just want you to sort of contemplate this for a moment. Just look at verse 14. It says that there was no day like that before it or after that Yahweh hearkened unto the voice of a man. For Yahweh fought for Israel. Now, some brethren don't necessarily see it quite this way. I take the Bible and what it says. The sun and the moon stood still. That means that the earth stopped rotating for about 24 hours. It could be 12, depending on what you take as a day. Now just think of what's involved in doing that. And some people have said, well, it's just too massive of a calculation to even think that God actually stopped the planet. It must have been like the sky or something and just made it look like the sun and the moon. No, he says the sun stood still and the moon stood still. That means the planet stopped rotating. And we didn't all get sucked to it or thrown off of it. Everything stayed the way it was. The entire universe is put into a state of stasis because a man prayed to God. If you're ever thinking or questioning whether God can work in your life, just remember this story. There is nothing that our God cannot do. In fact, it always amazes me that, you know, when you come to the power of prayer that's told to us in James, that they don't cite this example. He cites the one of Elijah who prayed and it rained for three years and prayed again and it rained. You know, we think, well, famine, right? You know, that's not that big a deal. Here, he stops the entire universe so that Joshua can overcome his enemies. You've got to believe that God, who can stop the universe, can also work in our puny little lives with our pathetic little problems that, when you compare them to this, are nothing. If he can stop the planet, can he not also work in your life and mine when we run into issues, whether it's with our family, whether it's in our ecclesia, whether it's in the ecclesial world, whether it's with work, whatever it might be? He is the Most High who rules in the kingdom of men. He wrote all the laws. We call it Newton's law. We call it Einstein's. It's not Newton's law or Einstein's law. They're just men who kind of scratched at it and almost maybe figured out maybe. He wrote all of this and put it all in place. 
And he can work in our lives just as much as he did in Joshua's life. And so we hear this, that never was it like this that God answered the man, the prayer of this man. And so the sun stays still while he finishes the job. And so what happens is in, in Joshua chapter 10 and verse 10, he goes on from there and he discomforts um, Israel, or before Israel, all these nations. And he slays them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chases them all the way down to Beth Horan, smote them to Ezekiel and unto this place called Makeda. So here is the city of um, Azekah, as it is today, still there. They've got the archaeological ruins of it as they've dug it up and uh, identified it. It's a place. This isn't a cunningly devised fable. They exist. And they went down to this place called Makeda. And it's interesting there. There are Makeda, or however you want to pronounce it. Um, Joshua chapter 10, verse 16, these five kids fled and hid themselves in caves at Makeda. And it was told Joshua, saying, well, look, they've got a hidden cage. It's okay, no problem. Just pin them down there. Roll some great stones over the mouth of the caves so that they can't get out. And that's exactly what they do. They go and they roll these stones over the mouth of the caves. And um, they say, don't stay. Pursue after your enemies. Smite the hindermost of them. Suffer them not to enter into their cities, for Yahweh your God hath delivered them into your hand. And so that's exactly what they do. Interestingly enough, if you go to the area around Ezekiel and Makeda, what do you find? Well, you find these great caves. And they actually put up these, these uh, iron barriers so that people don't fall into them. Because they're huge. Here's one of them here. And you can go down inside these caves. And this is what they look like on the inside. And you can see how they've been chiseled out. Those are chisel marks. From, and, and this is a place where you could put a lamp so that people could actually spend time in these caves. And they're, they're there to this day as a testimony to this very story that they went and hid in caves. You go to this place and there's the caves. So again, young people, these aren't stories like Tolkien and Lord of the Rings with cool names and places that are all made up. This is the real deal. This is reality. It's not somebody's imagination. This is reality. These really happened in these places are there, and you can go and see them today. And so what happens is then, they go on, and they come back after doing the mopping up the, in, the, in the south, and they come, and he says, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me. And so they do that, and they bring them out, and he tells the children of Israel, now put your feet on their necks. And so they put their feet on their necks. And Joshua says, fear not, nor be dismayed, be strong and of good courage, but thus so shall Yahweh do to all your enemies whom you fight. And so afterwards they take them, and they smoke them, and they hang them upon trees, and they're hanging there uh, until the evening when they are taken down. Brothers and sisters and young people, whatever the enemy is in your life, whatever issue you struggle with, remember this, that God is able to put your foot on the neck of your enemies and to crush the head of the serpent. Whatever problem you're dealing with in your life, God is greater than that problem. He can help you overcome it, but we've got to turn to him. And don't put our trust in ourselves, put it in God. Who smote all these people? More people died from the hailstones. When they ran out of time, he stops the planet. That's the kind of thing that our God is able to do. And we have to have the faith of Joshua that we are well able to overcome. Remember the words of the tennis farms? Oh, they're big cities. They're walled up to heaven. They're giants. They're huge. We're like little grasshoppers in our sight and in their sight. Well, that was the problem. They didn't see God in the equation. All they saw was their own ability. If that's what we do, young people, brethren and sisters, we're going to fail. Remember what it says of Abraham? He looked not at his own body, considered not his own body, now dead when he's 100 years old. The word considered not, Romans 4, means to fix your eyes upon. If you fix your eyes upon your own weakness, you don't stand a chance. That's not what Joshua did. He didn't fix his eyes upon his weakness. He said, we'd be well able to overcome them. Why? Because Yahweh will fight our battles for us if we join him. If we're on his side, 
Never mind trying to think, figure out if he's on my side. Let's get on his side, and he will help us fight our battles. And so the story goes on from there, and, and it's just an amazing story as this, this goes through, is that they, they take Makeda and they smite it with the edge of the sword, and they, they destroy the city and all the souls that they're in. Nobody remains. They do the same thing to this place as they do to Jericho. And they go from there in chapter 10 and verse 29, and they fight against this place called Libna. And they do the same thing to it. So here's Makeda, and they go over to Libna, and they obliterate Libna as well. And they take this city over. And they go from Libna now, and to the city of Lachish, which comes up later on in the time of Hezekiah. How do they do it? Yahweh delivers Lachish into the hand of Israel. And it's the second day they take it and smite it with the edge of the sword. And so they take that place over as well. And while they're at Lachish, the king of Gezer, who hasn't joined the confederacy, he says, look, i got to get in on this because sooner or later they're coming for me. So what he does is he gets in on this. Hohan, the king of Gezer, or Horan, the king of Gezer, came to Lachish, or from Lachish, to help Lachish, and Joshua smote him and his people. So they send in their reinforcements, and that doesn't work either, because it's Yahweh that's fighting for Israel, and Yahweh will fight for us as well. Verse 34 to 35, he goes on and he fights against Eglon, and they encamp against it, and they take it as well. On that day, they smite it with the sword and all the souls that are therein. So one after the other, Lachish, Eglon are, are taken. They come up to Abraham's city, to the city of Hebron, all Israel, all the soldiers come together and they fight there against it. And you can imagine the speech that Joshua would have given as they come to Hebron, the city where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried. This is the city of our fathers. And they go and they take that city as well. And they finish up and they come down to Debir. And they take Debir as well. So that's the southern campaign. The whole of the southern area is wiped out from Gilgal to Ai, Jericho, Gibeon, Jebus, Beth Horam, Gezer, Libna, Jarmuth, Hebron, Lachish, Eglon, Gaza, Debir, that whole section is just taken over and put into the hands of the children of Israel. And that's the southern area. So now we want to just focus for the last few minutes on the northern area. Because the same thing happens. When they hear the news about the south, because it was a, a kingdom under the hand of Jebus, uh, under the hand of Adonai Zedek, the, the king priest, basically, of, of Jerusalem. Um, once that's wiped out, the northern kingdom then says, folks, we're next. And so panic spreads out through the north. So just come over to Joshua chapter 11. Joshua chapter 11, verse 1, It came to pass in Jabin, the king of Hatzor, heard these things, that he sent Jobah, the king of Madon, to the king of Shimron, and Aksaf, and so on, and it spreads throughout the whole area. So this message goes to Madon, uh, Shimron, Aksaf, way up to the Danites, uh, or what is Laish, uh, all the ones in the south, the Canaanites, Megiddo, Dor, Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Hivites up in the north, and the Hittites. He sends messages out to the whole country and says everybody has to come and join in the fight. And let's just listen to Brother Lane give a little bit of background. A special bit of background um, about Hatzor. Quite interesting. Recently, somebody asked me, did Jesus know uh, where Hatzor, Hazor Hatzor was? Did he know about it? Well, I want to tap into what uh, Zach said on the bus. So Jesus grew up in Nazareth, and the place, old Nazareth, was inside a bit of a bowl, all surrounded by mountains. I can imagine Jesus growing up as a baby, as a little infant, but then he started going for walks as his mum and dad. I'm sure they took him to the brow of the hill, and then you can see the whole of the Jesuit Valley, absolutely magnificent view. And what stands out immediately is Mount Tabor. And he would have been brought up with the stories of Barak and <coughs> Deborah fighting against the king of Hatzor. So when he was walking from, Naz from Capernaum to Caesarea Philippi, you can't help but walk by Hatzor, and he was very much aware of what happened here, about uh, the battles and so on. So if you just know where Jesus grew up, you can't talk about the Deborah and Barak without knowing about Hatzor. All those things are all interlinked. So although we don't know much about how Jesus grew up as a young person in Nazareth, the surroundings in which he lived told him everything about the scriptures. So Joshua chapter 11, it came to pass... <coughs> When Joshua, when Jabin, 
king of Hatsor, so he was his kingdom, and this part, which has been excavated partly, is only the upper tail. All the big field here which has been found, that's all the lower tail, which hasn't even been excavated, but you can see. It's a huge city. So those, the upper part is where the king lived, where the palaces were, where the temples were. This is more the, the, the civil administration, you may say, and that's where all the people lived. But archaeologists are interested in big buildings, palaces, gateways. How do the people that can wait till you, get a bit more, <laughs> till you get a bit more money? So it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hatzor, had heard these things, he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, to the king of Shimron, to the king of Achshar, the kings were on the north of the mountains, the plain south of Kinneret, that is the Sea of Galilee, uh, and to the Am um, that's on the west, the Canaanite on the east, and on the west, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, the Jerusalem people, the Hivite, unto Hermon, as you can see right there at the end of the valley. So he rallied all the people, all the kingdoms, all the city-states, in all of Galilee, oh. all the way down to Jerusalem, to fight against uh, Joshua. You imagine what an enormous force that was. And therefore, it is, uh, Hatzor uh, is called the head of all those kingdoms. I mean, Zaka, the question, why is Hatzor so big? Well, first of all, the Fertile Valley was uh, split between Dan, in the north area of being, city state, and these lands here were all occupied and worked by the people from Hatzor. But if he was the head of all those kingdoms, I'm sure they paid tribute to him, so he's a very, very wealthy man and could afford to build a very, very big city. And he needed to be strong um, to keep all those other kings under his alliance as well. But, you know, they, God said to Joshua, be not afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time will I deliver them up all slain before Israel. Thou shalt hock their horses, you know what it is? You cut the hamstrings and, uh, and burn their church as fire. So Joshua did. They made war by the waters of Merom. Well, Mount Merom is a mountain just at the back there. It's a huge lake. That's where all those kings were encamped because they wanted water. <laughs> they didn't realize they were in a tra trap like that. They couldn't flee. And so Joshua came upon them and destroyed them all. At, at Joshua at that time turned back and took Hatzor, smote the king thereof with the sword, for Hatzor before was the head of all those kingdoms, and they smote all the souls that were there with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not one left to breathe, and he burnt Hatzor with fire. We're going to see that. We're going to see the fire, the buildings that were destroyed, stones being cracked by the fire of Joshua. Why then do we read in the book of Judges again about the king of Hatzor, also called Jabin? Now, Yavin, it may be the dynastic name, because Ben is in there, the son of, so that's a kind of domestic name. And it, in Judges chapter 4, the children of Israel again that even the sight of Yahweh, when Ehud was dead, and Yahweh sold him into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. That's not the same um, Canaan, not the same Jabin anymore, that is his son or grandson, still got the same family name. So it means that after Joshua had conquered this city and burned the fire, they didn't occupy the site. They left it and started to live in the mountains somewhere. Well, in the Middle East, if you don't occupy land and don't look after it, then you've got to reconquer it. So the Canaanites came back and lived again in Hatzor. Abraham bought a piece of land near Shechem. Well, Jacob had to buy it back again. It's the same piece of land, but it had been reoccupied by the Canaanites. If you don't occupy your inheritance, then you lose it. Mm -hmm. And then we get the story of Deborah, a prophetess, and Barak, and all that. And we'll talk a bit more about that. But the place where they rallied, round Mount Tabor, so Barak went to Mount Tabor, that's right beside Nazareth. So Jesus grew up. There's a story of knowing about King of Hatzor, the Battle of Joshua, he could conquer all those nations that were gathered together against Joshua without any much big problem. And that must have given Jesus the confidence in the power of God and that God would, if he could look after Joshua against a huge confederation of all the kings in the whole northern part of Israel and overcome them, then he could look after him as well. So this is the area of Merom. Uh, where they, they rallied together. But Elaine said this would have been where the Lord Jesus Christ grew up. Walking through this whole area, he would have known these stories, and they would have given him the courage to do what he had to do. Um, so here's the city of Hazor, um, or Hazor as we know it, and here's Merom. And there was water that comes through here, so when you've got all these massive armies together, you have to, it's not like a day where you have, you know, supplies flown in by helicopter and whatever else. You have to be able to feed and water these guys. So... 
That's usually strategically where they would be. And of course, we find that Joshua is told by Yahweh to be not afraid of them. Um, but tomorrow, about this time, I will deliver them up, all slain before Israel, and you're to hoof their horses and burn their cities with fire. So they're pitched in Merom in Joshua 11, 4. He's to go up and to fight against them, and that's exactly what he did. He came up with the people of war against him uh, by the waters of Merom. Suddenly, they weren't expecting them, and they fell upon them there. So they're, they're putting together this invasion army or this army to go attack Joshua, and they're going to try and you know come and take him. Joshua beats them to it, and he goes up, and he takes this whole area. And uh, the whole area is brought under his control. He takes the, the city, goes right up from here to the north, past Kadesh, up to the greater Zidon, uh, onto a place called Mish, or Misrephothayim, or something along that line. Um, what it means, interestingly enough, is the burning of water. And we think about that as the lake of fire. Right? Book of Revelation talks about it. Revelation 19, 20, Daniel 7, 11, Ezekiel 39, verse 6. They all stand as sort of parallels of this in, in the time of the end. There's some great types in that. But so what he does is he comes through this whole area. He comes to a place called Baal Gad, the Valley of Mishpah. He takes that as well, which is right below Mount Hermon that we'll look at later on. And um, he comes all the way down to Hatsor, burns it with fire. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But then he comes through this whole area and uh, fights against it. Kedesh, Merom, Madon, uh, Shimron, he takes Aksaf and Dor. Remember the witch of, of Endor and whatever else and so on. Jopneum, Megiddo, um, Jezreel. All this area through this whole area is taken and they all become cities that Joshua rules over. And the challenge Joshua gives Israel at the end of his life is this. It's in Joshua 24. Let's just look at it before we just look at Hazel for a minute. Um, Joshua chapter 24. This is, this is after they've conquered the whole land. He puts a challenge to them. In chapter 24 and verse 15, he says, Look, if it seem evil unto you to serve Yahweh, choose you this day who you're going to serve. You can serve the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood, or you can serve the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now dwelling. And the implied point there is, what good did it give them? The ones on the other side of the flood is where the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh are dwelling, on the other side of the river Jordan, right? They're all dwelling on that side, and it's Israel occupying their lands. Or the gods on the people on this side, who's living there now? The Israelites. And young people and brothers and sisters, that's the challenge to us. We've got to choose who we're going to serve. Are we going to serve the gods of the nations around us? Look how they help them out at this point in time. They were useless. Or are we going to serve our God who was able to deliver the victory? Well, we come then just to spend our last couple of minutes in Hatsor, uh, city of, of the north. This is the great city. Uh, that is spoken about a lot in Joshua. And again, these are not cunningly devised fables. For the longest time it was said, there is no Hatzor, you know, critics of the Bible, the city doesn't exist. And then along came this man, Yigal Yadin, 1955. And his father, by the way, was a man named Eliezer Sukhanik. He was the one who bought the first copy of the Dead Sea Scrolls, opened it and read it, the night of the proclamation of the state of Israel. And he read from Isaiah where it says the Lord will send his hand a second time to bring again the nation of Israel and bring them into their land. While the proclamation is going on that this is now the nation of Israel. That's his dad. Now Yadin was an, independent, was a, an archaeologist, but he was also a general in Israel's army sort of when he wasn't being an archaeologist. His day job as archaeologist, when necessary, he was one of their main generals. And um, many people in Israel, it's like this. And so he went and he excavated Hatsor in 1955. And this is a little bit of footage from that dig. Yigail Yadin opens excavations at the site of the ancient city of Hatsor in the summer of 1955. Hoping to find ruins from the reign of King Solomon, Yadin is excited when he uncovers a city wall similar to the one found at Megiddo. When excavators reach the end of the wall, Yadin confidently stakes out an outline on the ground based on the Megiddo gate and tells his excavators to dig there. 
To their amazement, as they dig down, the gate appears exactly where Yadin had marked. The archaeological community is so confident of Yadin's conclusions that they accept the three cities as type sites. So Hatsor then, excavated by Yadin, it means the castle. It's the fortress in the northern city in the north of uh, the whole area of Palestine, as they call it there, the Canaanite city. And this is the temple of Jabin, king of Hatsor, the palace that Joshua burned with fire. Remember, we're told it was head of all those kingdoms. So this is the headquarters. But we're also told in Joshua chapter 11, verses 10 to 11, that it was burnt with fire. So Lane's going to tell us now about this palace. Right, you're standing in a, a very ancient palace of uh, of Hatsor. Uh, the courtyard had a ceremonial function because a big stone block at the end, at the beginning, is an altar actually. So often sacrifices and palaces all goes together. King Melchizedek was king and priest, and there was often the task of a king. They also served as priests. And um, this building, then, uh, this is the <coughs> empty courtyard. The roof has been kind of reconstructed to follow the original roof pattern. Uh, here it was supported by massive trees standing on a base of basalt. The black stone is all volcanic rock, it's basalt, makes a very good foundation. The one on the top may have been containing this mud brick, you can see how solid this is. But look at the base itself, it's been, all the stones being been cracked by the fire of Joshua. And if you walk inside the building, you see it had a huge timber frame around it. So you get in the inside, you get part stone, part so messy, a lot of mud brick. And then they plastered it over and it looks very nice. But then on the inside, you can see the bottom basalt uh, course totally broken up and you know, cracked off the huge fire that was made here by Joshua to burn this palace to the ground. And just very interesting. So come inside there and look at the burning of Joshua. We just read that Joshua burned the city, Joshua 11. Now here is the evidence of it. Okay, so let's go inside. This basalt stuff, as you can see quite clearly, I just broken up, stretched by the terrific heat of the burning by Joshua. You need a temperature of about 800 degrees centigrade to be able to crack these stones. Yeah, so this whole building that was filled up, a, the bottom is all basalt stones, and the, the mud brick itself, which but can't stand the fire. But if you look at the stones in the corner there. If you pick them up by your hands, they're just breaking pieces. But they're being exposed to such an intense heat that destroyed the whole of the building. Yes? So Joshua destroyed Hatsor. Here's the evidence right in front of your eyes. So again, these aren't cunningly devised fables. We read that it was destroyed by fire. They uncover it, and what do they find? They find the evidence, the stones that have been broken uh, because of the intense heat. And you can actually still see the, the stains of the soot that's on the wall during that time period when Joshua came and uh, when they burned the city to the ground. That's the column he was mentioning at the entrance, the huge columns that were built. Uh, they believed that they would have brought the wood down from Lebanon. The altar of the king priest at the beginning and what's very interesting was that, you know, when you did went in there, and it's all in his book, he wrote a book on this, it's quite a fascinating book, they were trying to find the temple area. Um, and the archaeologists first uncovered what they believed was the temple complex. And so they dug down expecting to find some pretty cool stuff, and they found nothing. It was just this great slab, granite sort of, or, or limestone rock. And they all scratched their heads and they thought, well, you know, what happened here? Where's all the ruins? Where's all the stuff? And so Yagin had a bit of a hunch. He said, well, what if this isn't the floor? What if this is actually the roof? And when they burned it, because it was those big wooden beams, the roof collapsed and landed on top of everything. So he took a very brave move in archaeology to break through this find that they had, and they took out what did end up being the roof, and when they uncovered it, what they found was all the stuff of the temple. And this here is actually a Baal mask. So this is what they would take. They'd have the little idol, 
These would be all decorated with gold and painted and crusted with gems and jewels. And no different than the Roman Catholics today, where they take the statues of Mary or whatever it might be, and they dress them all up, and they put clothes on them and crowns. Well, they did the same thing to Baal back then, and this is a Baal mask. So they undug it, and you can see the little holes where the string would go through. And of course, it would have been covered in, in paint and in gold leaf and whatever else, but all those years that's gone... And um, on the left here is an Egyptian goddess from the same area. And they found all these monoliths that are underneath these stiles, um, the temple structure itself, all hidden under the roof, perfectly preserved because they've been under this foot deep slab of, of stone for all these years that nobody else could get through. And so here's one of the little temple altars, and they actually have cup holders in there because you would bring your drink offerings, a little wine glass, and it would sit right in that little area. And um, here's an incense altar laying on its side. And what else they found there was these miniature bronze bulls, or weather bales, because Baal, of course, was the god of the weather. He equates with Zeus, right? In Greek mythology, um, the whole idea of Zeus lobbing down lightning bolts, um, he's the parallel to Baal. Do you remember the story of Zeus when he seduces Europa? How does he do it? He transforms himself into a bull, right? And he goes and he takes her away. This is exactly the same concept, the same religion. One of the things they found, though, that was quite perplexing, you can see it here in what they call in situ, this is the way they found it, was this little idol here, and the head's busted off. But when they examined it, they said, well, why is the head busted off? It wasn't crushed. In fact, what they found at the back of the head was a sharp spear area where it had been struck by a spear from behind. And so Yadin was like, well, that's interesting. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 12, and at verse 2, it says, You shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods under the high mountains and the hills and the green trees. You are to overthrow their altars, break their pillars, burn their groves with fire, hew down the graven images of their gods, and destroy the names of them out of the place. So right here is where they'd taken that exact command of Moses and had chopped the head of the idol right off, preserved for some 3,000 years for the, the archaeologists to cover, or uncover. And so here's a, a, a kiln that they found, still with all the vessels in it from the day when it was destroyed, hadn't been touched for, for thousands of years, and of course it would eventually be... Um, be uncovered. What they found too was that the city of Hathor was later rebuilt. In fact, it was rebuilt, um, and it figures elsewhere in the Bible. We read about it in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 23 to 29. This is where um, Amnon is murdered. Remember, Absalom calls a great feast, brings all the king's sons. Well, he brings them to this very place. And it's here in Baal Hatzor that they are uh, that they put Amnon to death. It's the place of his death in 2 Samuel 13, verse 23. It's also the place, though, where they rebuild and uh, they have this great gateway here that Yadin had found, and Lane will just describe it. So the middle passageway of the gateway, that is, is a Solomonic gateway. And by the way, if you study the Temple of Ezekiel, has also got three chambers on either side. Yes, it's a Solomonic gateway in a sense. So there is one chamber, there's the second one, like in Dan, but here is the third chamber, that's the earlier type, a Solomonic gateway. Uh, he had built in, because King Solomon, he built all those cities. He built Megiddo, and Geze, and Chazor, and so on. Yes, so he occupied the cities with the children of Israel at the time of Joshua should have done. If they had done it, then Solomon didn't have to <laughs> start all over again building. And you can see the city wall, stone, a double city wall going around there. You can see the two lines of walls. Mm -hmm. They call it a casemate wall. It's kind of a double wall because on the inside, in peacetime, you can use those chambers for storage or you can store all your weapons there. But when the enemy comes, you want to make the wall stronger, they put a lot of dirt and stones uh, inside <coughs> the chamber, so then suddenly the, the, the wall becomes about 9 meters wide. 
Yes, so in peacetime you can use the chambers inside that hollow wall, casement wall, but in uh, wartime you fill them up with stones and they get a massive wall, nine meters thick. You can bash against them as a battering ram, you don't get anywhere at all. So this is then the basic Solomonic gateway. And once you understand this gateway, and I showed you the picture before, a two story building, yeah, sold is on top, uh, the two towers in front, inside ladders to the third story, and you can see far and wide and give you a signal of the watchman. Now you better watch out as a watchman because your blood will be upon your own head if you are uh, just not failing to warn of an invading. <coughs> so, an important feature in the town, and there's only one gateway, no other gateways. <coughs> uh, ancient cities, apart from one and two here, always have got only one gateway, one for entry and for exit. So there it is, the Solomonic Gateway he was talking about, and the reconstruction drawing that, that he did from that, um, to just to show us, basically, this is just the bottom area of it, just the last course of a couple of bricks. It would have been built way up high over that with mud brick, and would have towered over. And there's those casement walls, and uh, these are actually stables that he'll talk about later on. There's also a palace built by King Ahab there. And uh, what was very interesting about this, and we read about it, is Yedin, as he excavated this whole site, and it's still being excavated. These are current excavations from 1955 right through to today. And um, he was like, well, this is really odd because there's no water source for the city. You know, archaeologists are kind of like engineers. Once they get onto something, you know, they, they just can't let it go, right? So he found this divot in the field. And he said, you know, I bet, based on all his calculations and whatever else, that somewhere down here we're going to find the well. And it was just a dip in a field. So they started digging. Well, this is the beginning of the dig. And they dug, and they dug, and they dug, and they kept digging until they got all the way down to the very bottom. And at the very, very bottom of this well, which they date to the time of Ahab, um, you go all the way down there, right down under the earth. These are the ancient steps at the side. They put some concrete ones there. Lane was not very happy about it, but those are the original steps right down to the very bottom, and there is the water still there at the bottom of Ahab's well. So these Bible places you read about, they are really there. They were there, and they dug up today as evidence of the truth of the Bible. Interestingly, from Ahab's day, they found some ivory. And it's interesting that you read in Amos 6, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, that trust in the mountain of Samaria, wherein they, they name the chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. And he tells them, ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near, that lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches. He says, woe to you, destruction is coming. And young people and brothers and sisters, this world we live in, all its structures, its business, its schools, its infrastructure, and it all looks so solid and so real and so, you know, eternal. It's all going to be gone in a very short time. Don't put your eggs in this basket. It's all going to get ruined. It's all going to be gone, just like it was for these people here, because along came this guy, Tiglath Pileser, the king of Assyria, and he came in 2 Kings 15 and verse 29, and he destroyed the city of Hatsor. And we're told in the prophecy of Jeremiah 49, 33, that Hatsor would be a dwelling for dragons and a desolation forever, and no man shall abide there, um, nor any son of man dwell in it. And that is exactly the situation today. So the lesson for us from Hatsor then is read through what the Bible has to say. Don't let the gods of the nations in whose land we dwell become our gods, because they cannot deliver us. They're not going to help us. In the day when we need them, they're not going to help us. What do they do for the nations around us? How did Sigmund Freud end up, one of the great gods of this world of psychology? He's the moron that introduced cocaine to this whole society. So if you're reading his books, they were all a cocaine drug trip. Like, that's the kind of people that the world looks at and says, oh, they're brilliant. It's rubbish. The gods of this world are useless. Absolutely useless. We've got to put our trust in this God. And don't let their gods become the things that we serve. Do what Joshua was commanded. 
cut their heads off, knock them over, push them out of our lives, do not invest in their types of things. We are well able to overcome them. Remember the lesson of the Valley of Adjuman. When you run into problems in your life and it looks like it's just something we can't do, remember that it's God's side that we have to get ourselves onto. And if we do that, he is able to help us to overcome. If you're interesting, there's a, a great book by Yadin. Uh, you have to get it at a second-hand bookstore or look for it online. It's called Hatsor, and it's a great read if you want to get more of the background information.